Um, before I get started, I do have a few announcements to make that I want to go ahead and do because I'll forget otherwise, and then I'll have people upset with me. Uh, the first is this. Operation Christmas Child is in need of empty shoe boxes. So if you have any empty shoe boxes, you don't have to put anything in them. Just bring them in here to the church. Uh, they would love to have those. They're going to start wrapping this week in preparation uh, for the uh, week in which they are the collection center here uh, for this region. The other is this, the Thanksgiving boxes for the food pantry uh, need to be in by next week. And when you bring them in, we've already started collecting. You can just place them over here to the side of the stage. And then finally, uh, we are hosting a women's conference here December 1st. It's, it's being held by Empowered Ministries. Um, and so that is December 1st. And anybody who's ever told you there's no such thing as a free lunch lied to you. Uh, it's a totally free event, including lunch. They do ask that you sign up so that they can have a head count, so they have enough food for you uh, when you get here, but it is totally free. The conference, food, everything is free. So if you will jump on either our Facebook page or our website, or they have a place where you can sign up out in the Welcome Center this morning, um, they just need a head count for how many will be attending. And I know that this will be an awesome event. They are also in need of desserts for lunch and men to serve them, not for men to make the desserts. They want to be able to eat them, but they need men to come and just help serve lunch for that day. So if you can help out either by serving or preparing desserts, um, I'm going to ask these three ladies to stand, Lisa Bowling, Tammy Kohler, or Kristen McRoberts, if you guys don't mind standing up, just so everybody knows uh, who you're looking for. If you can help out, uh, if you can reach out to one of these ladies, they would appreciate it. Um, I and mean, I know that that will be a chance for you ladies to be blessed. So you want to check that out. I'm definitely going to have to move a little bit because I brought some props in this morning. I, uh, anybody that knows me knows that one of my favorite pastimes is hunting. And so actually Dale Mays this morning stopped me. He said, you're preaching this morning, aren't you? I said, how do you know? He said, somebody brought a tree stand up on the stage. So <laughs> I need you to close your eyes for a minute as I go through all this stuff I have. <laughs> if, uh, if you are like me and you enjoy deer hunting, more than likely you have spent quite a bit of money in the pursuit of this passion. One of the best memes I've ever seen, Reva, can we throw that up? Is this, my greatest fear maybe, is if I die, there we go, when I die, my wife will sell all my hunting gear for what I said I paid for it. So guys, help me out that's, that's with me. If I kick it first, you find Tiffany and you explain to her the true value of things. But I have purchased a lot of things in the pursuit of this. These are heated insoles that go inside my boots so my toes don't get too cold. Um, that's probably, I guess, just comfort. This is a rattle bag. You try to mimic the sound of bucks fighting so they'll come in. I've got a grunt call, again, to make the deer think a buck's there. Some no-scent spray, some binoculars. We could, we could go for a really long time. Flashlight, range finder, a pool rope. I haven't hit anywhere near the bottom yet, okay? I'm going to stop going because she didn't close her eyes. She's still paying attention. She's taking notes. One of the favorite things, my favorite purchases, though, is this climbing stand. It enables me to go anywhere I want to. I'm not limited to where I have decided to hunt previously. I should have taken this one apart before I started. I'm not going to. <clears throat> There's a top and a bottom. There's no ladder. You use this apparatus to climb the tree. Many of you have seen that. If you haven't, just take my word for it. All of these things, though, are just so that I can enjoy hunting more. They're either comfort. I hope that they'll make me a little more successful. It hasn't worked yet, but hopefully someday. Convenience. But there's really only one device that I really, truly depend on. This is my safety harness. So anytime you see me going out to hunt, you're going to see me wearing one of these. This thing will go as high as you would like in a tree, as far as you're willing to climb. Sometimes for me, that's like three or four feet, because I don't like heights. Even for me, I typically get about 18, 20 feet in the air. A lot of guys will go a lot higher even than that. But when I go up into a tree... I am totally dependent on this thing. If something happens, I need to know that it's going to hold 
the weight it was designed to hold, that it will hold me up, that it will literally save my life if I need it to. And so my question for you this morning is, what is it that you depend on? What is it that you depend on, and will it hold up? And what happens when it doesn't hold up? You see, this is how the early church survived. They became boldly dependent on the Holy Spirit. If you are just visiting with us, we are five weeks, I believe, into our Acts series, the series going through the book of Acts. We have made it all the way through three and a half chapters, so we're going good. We are going to be in the second half of chapter four this morning, if you want to turn and hold there. Now, the book of Acts hosts more references to the Holy Spirit than any other book in the Bible. I don't know if you realize that. It actually hosts more references than the gospel accounts combined. The Holy Spirit is mentioned more than 55 times in the 28 chapters of the book of Acts. And I think it's obvious why it was mentioned so much. It's because it was important. It was vital to the success of the early church. As a matter of fact... The early church doesn't take off without the leading and the work of the Holy Spirit. We're not standing here this morning, if not for the works of the Holy Spirit. And the apostles knew this. They knew they were totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. And as such, they desired to be filled with it. They desired for the Holy Spirit to reach every corner of their lives. And the Holy Spirit empowered them to do certain things. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. The first is this, the Holy Spirit empowered them to pray for purpose, not protection. If you'll turn with me to verse 23 of the fourth chapter of Acts, and this is where the bulk of our text is going to come from this morning. These words are on the screen as well if you choose to follow along that way. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported that all the chief priests and the elders had said to them, When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign God, they said, You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats. Okay, think for just a minute. The threats, they know they're coming. They've already been experiencing the threats. So this is the time where they stop and pray, Lord, take them away. Do something with these people. Keep us safe. Deliver us from this persecution, right? But that's not their prayer. They say this, Enable your servant to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name, through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Okay, so verse 23, let's do a little recap. It says on their release. So where were they released from? Anybody pay attention last week? No? Nope. Okay. They're released from jail. Okay, they had been jailed, they had been questioned, drugged before the courts, and the only reason they were released is because the courts couldn't decide how to punish someone for healing someone else without making the crowd of people angry. And so put yourself in a moment for the disciple, in the disciples' shoes. They had just seen their leader killed, they had been in trouble themselves, they were drugged before the courts, they were imprisoned, they were threatened, they were beaten. Now these men had families, they had loved ones, they had things they liked to do. I'm sure they didn't desire to be beaten, they didn't desire to be jailed or even destroyed. But they realized there was something much greater going on. Something much greater than their safety and their comfort. They knew that their status in heaven mattered more than their status or their, even their safety here on earth. And so what do they pray for? They pray for more boldness, more of the Holy Spirit, more signs. And so I ask, what do we typically pray for? Safety, deliverance, healing, protection, right? If we're sending out a mission team, what's the first thing we pray for? Traveling mercies. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that kind of prayer. The early church 
we'll get there. But first, God, give us more boldness. Give us your purpose. We want to speak boldly in your name. What had just gotten them in trouble? Their boldness. And yet, we want more. God, stretch out your hand. They have walked literally with Jesus. They had been filled with His Spirit, but that wasn't enough. They want more of God. Some of you that have children are experiencing the sugar high that I have experienced with mine the past week. Um, Mine went trick-or-treating in Sardinia on Saturday evening last week, and then, of course, they participated in our trunk-or-treat event here. And last week, then, their cousins call them and want them to come trick-or-treating with them in their community in northern Kentucky. And we're sitting around the table, and we're discussing whether or not they're going to go. And I said, listen, you have more candy than you can eat before next Halloween. Surely you don't want more candy, right? Like, that's enough candy. And guess what their response was? You're right, Dad, that's enough candy. No, they said, you can't have too much candy. It's not possible. And that's the way the early church was with the Holy Spirit. They had been filled, but that wasn't enough. God, we need more. You see, these people had walked with Jesus. They had experienced His death. They would experienced His resurrection. They had experienced His ascension. They had literally at this point converted thousands and thousands of people. They had healed people in His name. They had overcome obstacles, and yet they felt the need to pray, God, give us more boldness. And if they needed to pray that way, how much more do we need to pray that way, church? These people doing these great things prayed like that. And if they needed to, I can tell you, I need to. 2 Timothy 1, 6-8 through says this, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. The gift of God is the Holy Spirit in this text, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit God gave, gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, His prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Craig Groeschel said this once in a message, Boldness is a behavior born out of belief. We speak boldly about what we believe deeply. How amazed are people at your boldness. So how long has it been since you have prayed for boldness? Or perhaps a better question is, have you ever prayed for boldness? And I believe if we want the Spirit's leading in our life, that we need to pray for it. We need to seek it. And so the second thing the early church did, they realized in being dependent on the Holy Spirit that God is present even if He feels absent. They had spent years with Jesus. They had seen Him killed and come back to life. And imagine their despair. Imagine their disappointment when they learned He's leaving again. Wait a minute, our king, our rabbi had returned. Imagine how lonely it must have felt to learn he was leaving again. One minute he was there and the next he is gone. It would have been easy for them to wallow in that loneliness. And I think we can allow ourselves to begin to feel that way. That God's presence is somehow dependent on how we feel. But God is still present even when he is absent. And sometimes it's hard to feel His presence because we've failed so often or we've fallen so far. We think that there's no way that God is still hanging around. Or maybe we're in a difficult season of our lives and we just can't see where God is in the moment. But I tell you, there are times in your life when you feel most removed from God that He is doing His best work in you. Because God is sovereign and His faithfulness does not depend on your feelings. He is present even when He feels absent. The 139th Psalm, David writes in it, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. 
If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. I took my son Tucker hunting. Tucker is six years old, and we went out uh, last week or the week before, and we were sitting in a shooting house, and he was having a good time, but as light started to fade, he started to get a little bit nervous. He says, what time is it? Isn't it about time we go on in? I said, it's all right. I said we still have 15 minutes left where we can see. We're going to sit out here until it's completely dark. This is the best time of day. Don't, don't waste it. Yeah, but it's getting kind of dark. And I said, I understand it's getting kind of dark. It's okay. We know where we're at. He said, you're going to stay right beside me? I said, I'm going to stay right beside you. And you have a light? I said, I have a light. We're good. And so that settled him down because he knew that his father was there and he had the light. But sometimes we miss, don't we, how awesome a power lives inside of us. Get this. The creator of the universe, spirit, lives inside of you. And we miss it. You know, we look back and we think, if I could just walk where the disciples walked, if I could just be with Jesus, how much easier would it have been for me to believe? How much greater would my faith have been? How much better things could I have done? But Jesus tells us in John, the 16th chapter, that isn't the case. Starting in verse 1, he's talking to his disciples and he says this, All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. Now listen to this. Very truly, I tell you, it is good for you that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate, which is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And yet we forget, don't we, about this sometimes. And, and sometimes we base God's presence on how we feel. We'll speak of a service like this morning and, oh, I felt God's presence. I felt the Spirit move. And yet... We forget that this power is always present in us. And if we want to boldly depend on the Spirit, we have to recognize His presence in us. And then finally, boldly depending on the Spirit changed the way the early church lived. Think of who these men were before Jesus. Last week, Joe talked a little bit and read about how they were untrained, ordinary men, right? And think of who they even were during their times with Jesus. How often they were confused, never grasping what He said. How they doubted Him. How even at times they denied even knowing Jesus, let alone following Him. And then in this short little bit of time, they've done a complete 180. They've went from people like that to people literally staring death in the face. That's not an exaggeration. The early church is full of martyrs. Many of their deaths gruesome. They knew that that was a very real possibility for them. And yet they had went from people consumed with fear to people living boldly. They had went from people consumed with what they had to being boldly generous with others around them. They went from ordinary people to the backbone of the church. You see, Jesus gave them the greatest task that had ever been given. But he also gave them the greatest power that had ever been given. And he's given that to you. That same power that lived in the disciples lives in you. That same power that healed people. The same power that led to all those conversions lives inside of you. And I'm going to speak for myself this morning. Sometimes that thought can be more intimidating than it can be empowering. Because if that thought is true, that the same power that lives inside of the disciples lives inside of me, that means there's going to be times when I am uncomfortable. 
That means there's going to be times when I'm going to be tasked with something I don't initially want to do. I may be asked to do something that the world deems crazy, and I don't need any help in that area. I'm crazy enough. And it means that there's, there's going to be times where we require something of ourselves so big that if we fail, we're going to look like fools. And it means that in my life, at times, I have been failing. Dallas Willard said this, I'm learning to exercise the power of the kingdom of Christ and His Word and Spirit to minister good and defeat evil in all the connections of earthly existence. And then he quotes Acts 10. He says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with Him. And then he says this, and I think it's really good. Apprenticeship to Jesus means that in tiny steps, we learn to exercise this power seen in Jesus. If you want to be like Jesus, you have to be boldly dependent on the Holy Spirit. And so are you obeying his promptings? You see, I think there's a great tragedy that goes on. I think sometimes we can become so good at quenching the flame of the Holy Spirit that we could never see it. And we become so good at quieting that voice that we can never hear it. And the tragedy is we miss out on what's on the other end of that leading. What God has in store for you. And so how do we, as Dallas said, learn to exercise that power? I think there's a few ways. The first is study and believe God's Word. John 6, 63 says, The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. The second is this, pray for it and listen. Verse 31 of our text today tells us that the disciples were praying earnestly, so earnestly that when the Holy Spirit came down, it literally shook the building they were in. You see, when the Holy Spirit comes down, it's evident to you and it's evident to those around you. So pray for it and listen. And then thirdly, test it. And I want to be clear here. I don't mean test God. I mean test what you are hearing. Because that is one of my biggest questions. Is what I'm being led to do the Spirit's prompting or is it Jeremy's desires? And so we test it. We test it to make sure it aligns with Scriptures and that it aligns with the characteristics of God. I think that's why community is so important that we have others that we can spur on. You know, that's one of the things I love, have loved about our small groups. If you are not a part of one, I hope you catch on next spring when they come back around. And the building up of one another. Now, I'm not a great theologian. I don't understand all the workings of the Holy Spirit. I read this text and sometimes I have more questions than I have answers. I don't even fully grasp how these people were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and yet time and time again we read that they are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes down on them again. But I do know this, the disciples were boldly dependent on the Holy Spirit, and yet they desired more. And that's what I want for my life. I want to be deeply filled with the Holy Spirit. And sadly, there's places in my life that I have not allowed His work and I want those areas vanquished because we cannot settle for a life on our own. We have to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 3 verse 16 says this, I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work within us, to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So what's the takeaway here this morning? Where does the rubber hit the road for us? Robbie spoke in our opening of this series on Acts 1 how one of the proofs of the resurrection was the change in the lives of the disciples. 
You want your neighbors, you want your family, you want your friends to begin to take serious the words of life you try to speak into their life. They better not be seeing the same old, same old. They better be seeing a life that is transformed by the Spirit. Galatians 5 says this, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes on in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to... Tr- To Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. We had this conversation actually in our small group last week. What kind of fruit is your life producing? You see, I think we can totally understand everything we talked about this morning. On an intellectual level, we can get it and still not allow it to change us. Still have a cold heart And a life that remains unchanged. And so for you, Christian, I ask, what is your fruit? Is your life producing the fruits of the flesh? Or is it producing the fruits of the Spirit? You see, I asked earlier, what are you dependent on? I think we're all dependent on something. You may be dependent on a paycheck. Probably most of us are in some way or another. You may be dependent on a relationship. You may even be dependent on a vice to get you through the day. But will that thing hold up and what happens when it doesn't? You know, when I purchased this harness, I I bought like everything that's ever purchased anymore on Amazon. And so I went through and I read all the reviews. I wanted to know from people who had tested it. And I went through and I looked at the specifications because I don't know if you noticed or not, but I'm not the smallest guy in the world. I wanted to know that it was rated to hold me. I wanted to know the thing I was putting my life into its hands was sufficient. So for you, Christian, what does your life depend on? If it's dependent on the Holy Spirit, I believe we will see the fruits and it will be evident. And if you're in here and you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, I pray this morning you would recognize His voice. Here in just a second, the band is is going to come up and lead us in a song of invitation. But I want us to read from John 16, beginning in verse 8. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. What he's saying here is recognize the voice If there's anything inside of you this morning convicting you of your shortcomings, convicting you of your sins, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. He's speaking about the Holy Spirit here. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. If there's any hope inside of you, if you can look around this fallen world, if you can look around in difficult situations and you feel hope inside of you, that is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And in verse 12, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now Bear, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. If there is any part of you that feels drawn to accept this truth that you are hearing, this truth about Jesus, I want you to recognize what that feeling is this morning. That is the Heavenly Father pursuing you through the person of the Holy Spirit. And so I pray that you don't ignore it. I pray that you don't quench it. I pray that you recognize it for what it is 
and realize you cannot put it off for another day. So now the band is going to come forward. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And that song of invitation is your opportunity to obey the Spirit's prompting, to recognize what is going on. And I pray that today is the day that you stop putting it off and that you say yes, that you are baptized into those waters for the forgiveness of your sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit that He may dwell in you forever. Will you pray with us? Father God, I just uh, I thank You for Your Word. God, I thank You for Your Spirit. How hard it is sometimes to grasp the fact that, that You said it is better for Christ to go away so that we may have the Spirit. Father, it is, it is just an understanding beyond my belief, but I thank You for that power. God, I pray that we learn to, to stop and to listen and to obey. And Father, I pray that if there is anyone in here today who has not, not yet accepted that truth, Father, that they would recognize and obey the Spirit's leading in their life and be obedient to baptism. Father, we thank you for Jesus and the hope that he gives us, and it's in his name that I pray. Amen.